We're now moving to the final six lectures of this course, and that's a good moment to take stock and review the path we've traveled in the previous six. The exam will test you on detailed knowledge, but the following overview provides a broad framework that may help you memorize that knowledge more easily. We can afford to do this because the previous six lectures were all shorter than 50 minutes. Altogether, I've deprived you of 30 minutes of lecture time. It's only fair to make up for that now. We began with the decline of magic in lecture 13. The discovery of the physics of sound was a major accomplishment of empirical science. But the demystification of musical sound left music without a credible claim to people's time and attention. This was especially true of instrumental music, which is, after all, nothing but sound. Without text, or so it was thought, music has nothing to say, nothing to signify. It is mere vibration of air. Three lectures later, in number 16, entitled Ancients and Moderns, we referred back to this development. The decline of magic left a perceived emptiness that called for substance to fill it. This came in the shape of musical learning, the kind of learning associated with old counterpoint, the stile antico. Musical sound alone may be mere vibration of air, but a complex fugue engages the mind, and what engages the mind does not die away with the sounds. It gives music a chance to vindicate itself. The idea of learning created a new distinction between Kenner and Liebhaber, between those who understand complex music and those who just love the sound of it. To be a Kenner is to be an educated person. A person without education is barred from full understanding. That distinction will become fundamental to Western musical culture, with consequences that will occupy us until the last lecture. Opera also escaped the new disparagement of musical sound. For this genre too could boast something that engages the mind and that justifies its claim to your time. It is lyrics, poetry, lofty sentiments, dramatic action. In lecture 15, Bel Canto, We spent some time on the formal conventions of arias. Late Baroque arias, like those of Handel, typically feature an alternation between ritornello and solo. We find these same conventions also in concertos, as we discussed in lecture 14, Matter and Form. The example we took was the Vivaldi Violin Concerto. Ritornello form became universal, as we can tell also from the examples of Bach. The difference between concerto and aria is that arias have lyrics to tell you what the music is about. In the Baroque, they tend to be about a single emotion, like anger or weariness, or wonder at the shade cast by a tree. It's important to stress, however, that music as such was not rejected. It's just that people expected less from it. It's an innocent luxury, as one influential writer said. Music just has to know its place but you can still enjoy it for what it is. And people did. It is fun to indulge in the simple thrill of sound, even if it is merely sound. And if you don't expect more than that, there's no way you can be disappointed. This was the subject of lecture 17, Storm and Drive. The lecture was about the musical sensation of speed, about musical momentum. And we asked how you would create it. That's by definition a question of sound, about the mere vibration of air. It's not enough just to conceive it in the mind and write it down on paper. 
Only actual sound will give you the sensation, the thrill of speed. But in lecture 18, we noted that composers were interested in more than just the effect as such. They also sought to control it. And that raises the question, why? Why did they want to bring this basic thrill under compositional control? To what purpose? The superficial answer is that they wanted to articulate. They loved creating dramatic moments to slow down, speed up, increase volume, decrease it, modulate to another key, unveil a new musical theme, use it to hammer home the new key. This is different from Baroque music, like the Vivaldi Concerto or the Handel Aria, or indeed the trio sonata of Corelli, which runs at an even pace and is like an engine nicely purring along. You don't need to control that. You can just leave it running. So that is one way to remember the basic narrative going from lecture 13 to lecture 18. Matter and form are static, storm and drive are dynamic. The desire to articulate has to do with dramatic action, for the new style is intimately linked with the theater. All these efforts are seen to culminate in the creation of a new musical form, the sonata form. In lecture 19, we will examine sonata form and listen to it in two compositions, the trio from Don Giovanni that we saw in the last lecture and the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven. With sonata form, the idea of musical understanding will receive a massive boost. To explain that, we will also need to devote some time to the person and the life of Beethoven, Ludwig van Beethoven, the pivotal figure between the 18th and 19th centuries. He is a key figure in a kind of comeback of music. Not only will the art recover from the decline of magic, but it will be widely regarded in the 19th century as the highest of all art forms. That's a pretty amazing turnaround. To understand sonata form, it is most useful to think in terms of the cadence. You will remember that the cadence is an invention of the 14th century. It represents the revolutionary idea that you can do more than just place chords side by side, like you would park cars next to each other in the parking lot. Actually, you can make it appear that there is something like a force of gravity that attracts one to the other. Nearly five centuries later, in the time of Mozart and Beethoven, the significance of that idea becomes fully apparent. The preferred chords in music have long since become triads, and the cadence in its most basic form has become a progression involving three successive triads. That progression is usually described as 1-5-1, or also tonic-dominant-tonic. The basic idea is to return where you started, away from the home chord and then back to it, with a departure to another chord in the middle. But you don't move away to just any chord. There has to be that force of gravity pulling at the chord in the middle, wanting it to go back. And you feel that pull because that middle chord by itself sounds open-ended. If nothing follows, it'll be hanging in the air and leave us without a sense of closure. If that sense is not strong enough, you can always give that middle chord the extra push of a dissonance. The final chord resolves the dissonance and brings a sense of closure. But here's the important point. You can delay its arrival and exploit this as a source of musical tension. An example is the cadenza at the end of an aria or concerto, where the final chord is delayed indefinitely. This will allow the soloist to take center stage and still keep the audience on the edge of their seats. Even with a long delay, the force of gravity will hold it all together, at least if it's handled well. In the same way, you can extend the cadence to embrace a whole movement. Of course, the points that correspond to the three chords will need special emphasis. We have already seen how composers did that. They marked those points with musical themes, often very simple ones, and then went out of their way to prepare for their arrival.
This is easy to hear in the trio of Don Giovanni, for those three points are all marked by the same theme. There is a reason for that, which we will see later. But for now, we can illustrate the basic idea of sonata form by taking those three points with their themes and play them side by side. So here is the first chord of the cadence and the first statement of the theme. Now we move from that first chord to the second, and the same theme is now in a different key, the dominant key. Finally, we come back to where we started, with the third chord, which is the same as the first. In a basic cadence, the three chords need not last much longer than about five seconds. But here, the progression is extended to an operatic set piece that lasts more than five minutes. Well, so what? What sense does it make to do that? To find out, we'll now have to take the basic progression of the cadence and map the action of the opera on top of it. We have seen that there are some heavy things happening on stage. There is, first of all, Elvira, a woman who has two conflicting emotions at the same time. Anger at a villain and love for a sinner, something you could never convey musically in a Baroque aria. Then there is a man who ruthlessly exploits her vulnerability and who represents a different kind of conflict between the love he protests and the sex he wants. Finally, there is the servant who goes through the motions of a noble lover while trying his hardest not to crack up with laughter. Altogether, three conflicts. That is one complicated scene. How is to one to handle all this musically? Let's start with that first theme, the one we just heard. Elvira tells her own heart to stop beating for this man, and yet it goes on beating, she can't help it. Let's be academic about this and call this theme A, the theme of her heart. Elvira is also still angry at Don Giovanni. He is a villain, she says, a betrayer and not deserving of pity. She has a different theme to say this. It's the theme of her anger, which the musicologist in me identifies as B. Only after that theme does Leporello notice her, and he hushes his master, saying it's Elvira on the balcony. Let's call that theme C. With all this, we're still actually in the home key, corresponding to the first chord in a cadence. But now there's going to be a shift to a different key, not because Mozart is slavishly following the conventions of sonata form, but because he wants to exploit those conventions to dramatic effect. In his operas, a key change typically stands for a decisive change in the situation. And just as typically, the character who appears to bring about that change is the person in control of the situation. After all, everybody else will have to sing in the key that he has chosen. Don Giovanni was planning to seduce Elvira's maid. Now that Elvira herself appears on the balcony, he changes plans. I want to seize the moment, he says to Leporello. You stand over there and do what I say. Then he gets ready to address Elvira 
and moves to another key. What to do in that new key? Don Giovanni knows Elvira only too well. He may even have overheard her words of despair at the beginning of the trio. If he now wants to address her on her own terms, he'll have to pick the theme of her heart, not that of her anger. Theme A, in other words. And that is exactly what he does. Elvira, my love. Elvira, her first response is as you might expect. The very sound of his voice fills her with anger. So theme B, the theme of her anger, naturally follows theme A of her heart. Isn't that the scoundrel, she says to herself. <laughs> Don Giovanni does not wait for her to finish that thought. Yes, he interrupts, it is I, and I beg for your mercy. Now Elvira is thrown in turmoil, and this brings us to theme C the one Liparello sang when he noticed her on the balcony. In the same way and on the same theme, he now notices that she is about to fall in the same trap. Look at this foolish woman, he says. She's going to believe him again. In terms of sonata form, we should be expecting an eventual return to the home key. That will take another modulation, of course, and if Don Giovanni is truly in control, then it will be he who initiates it. Leaping now ahead, we'll see exactly what, that this is exactly what happens. He threatens suicide. She believes him, and she is ready to come down. Once we're back in the home key, only one theme can realistically capture that situation. And this, of course, is the theme of her heart. Giovanni and Elvira now sing that theme together as a duo as if they were lovers already. I've said before that you don't need to be aware of these key changes as you listen. The point about opera is to experience the human drama. On the other hand, if you ask why the drama is so incredibly powerful in this trio, then the key changes may help explain it. And in a course like this, it is the professor's job to point them out. But I still left out something that is critically important. In telling the story, I made a leap ahead to the point where Elvira already capitulates and we move back to the home key. But of course, she is not going to be that easily won over. He has deceived and betrayed her in the past. She knows that his words are the last thing she should believe. Let's go back to the moment when he first addresses her and she immediately responds in anger. At that point, the situation is really as open-ended as the middle chord of a cadential progression. She may be in turmoil, but she's also angry and in no mind to come down from the balcony. Mozart will have to convince us musically that she will eventually be won over. Now, by raising the stakes even more, and have Don Giovanni move even further away from the home key. Now he no longer addresses Elvira by singing her own theme. He serenades her with a totally new melody in a totally new key, further away from the home key than ever. His move is arresting and unexpected. You can now tell that Don Giovanni is gaining ground because he can give free rein to his lyrical effusions and she is not interrupting him, at least not at first. From a musical point of view, you have to wonder how we're ever going to get back to the home key. The answer, as it turns out, is with great difficulty. Elvira interrupts his song. Giovanni threatens suicide. And now the path back to the home key is essentially a downward slide along a scale. Not a simple white key scale whose outcome you can predict, but one that involves half steps 
in ways that undermines one's sense of direction. This truly is a struggle with an uncertain outcome. As if to make the outcome even more uncertain, Mozart pauses halfway down the descent, on the dominant in fact, where the force of gravity is felt at its most acute. Let's now hear the first half of the descending scale, along with the corresponding chord progressions. Mozart lingers on this halfway point. It is a long moment of suspense until the downward slide continues and leads us back to the home key. At last, we experience the resolution and closure that cadences are supposed to give us. The sonata form has come full circle. All these are technical explanations in terms of scales and chords and resolution and closure. But listen to the same stretch as it is actually sung. This is a struggle of life and death. No, she says, I don't believe you. Please believe me, he replied. I'll kill myself. Come down, please, my beloved. No, she insists in a swelling back and forth. But then she falls silent. The sonata form proceeds and it tells us without words what the outcome is. At the end of the trio, Elvira disappears from the balcony and is on her way down. In the recitative that follows, Don Giovanni's first words to Leporello reflect his pride in a job well done. So, he says, what do you think? But let me now ask a different question. It is the familiar one. Sonata, que me veux-tu? Sonata, what do you want of me? We don't have to wait for an answer. Sonata form speaks both with words and without. It is the language of opera, but it will prove just as powerful as the language of the symphony. And that brings us now to Beethoven. Let's go to Vienna, the capital of Austria, and visit the place not far from where Mozart lived. It's in a boulevard now known as the Wien Seiler. Once upon a time, this is where the river Wien rang, ran before it was filled up. And the building to the right, a theater that once looked out over the river, was called the, the, the Theater on the Wien, the theater on the river Wien. Two centuries ago, the theater looked like this. It was one of the major opera theaters and symphony halls of Vienna. The hall inside has become a place as important to music history as the church in Leipzig where Bach worked. And astonishingly for a theater, it has not burned down in the more than two centuries of its existence. On your next trip to Vienna, you can visit it yourself. The Theater on the Wien enjoys the unique distinction of having hosted the world premieres of two Beethoven symphonies in one night. Here is that night, the 22nd of December in the year 1808, as recreated in the BBC documentary called the genius of Beethoven.
that's was Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and it will be our second example of Sonata Form today. But before we turn to the music itself, let's explore its historical context a little. For with Beethoven, we reach a critical moment in the history of another theme, that of the status of composers between servitude and independence. We'll take the same point of departure as before, the composer's portraits. There is in fact a good number of portraits of Beethoven. Like the portraits of the old Bach, they seem to tell a story that extends across a lifetime. And just as in Bach's case, we see a face that gradually withdraws, retreating behind an unseen wall into the safety of a lonely inner world. There is as yet no sign of this in 1802. At this point, we see a man in his early 30s, well-groomed, smartly dressed, handsome, successful, a musician already recognized by Viennese society as one of the outstanding composers of the age. 33 years later, he seems somehow less approachable. The man who just looked at us with quiet confidence, with eyes that spoke of goodwill, begins to look like he is a stranger to us, someone whose thoughts we cannot guess. In a telltale sign, he is not making eye contact, even if he seems to miss our gaze by only a hair. In the next portraits, as he moves into his 40s and then early 50s, his face fills with pent-up tension. Even when he does seem to make eye contact, it is hard to be assured that he thinks of us as well-intentioned towards him. When I could have been no older than about five, I remember seeing the famous portrait of 1820 on the cover of an LP. It felt somehow frightening. Why does he look so angry, I asked my father. I don't recall his answer. The answer in part is that he wasn't angry. At least I don't think he was when he posed for these portraits. There certainly was a lot of anger inside him and it could explode out of all proportion to what seemed like barely provocations at all. It did frighten people because there was no way of predicting it. For the roots of that anger, we'll have to go further back. But this early portrait at age 32 is friendly and it shows what he himself thought of as his natural disposition, the temperament he was born with. But in this very year, 1802, we'll have to visit another place in Vienna to understand the shadow that would soon spread across his face. It is this sunny suburb called Heiligenstadt, the ideal place to take a break from the hectic life of Austria's capital. What you see here is the house where Beethoven spent the summer and fall of 1802, and where he wrote a document that no one was to read until after his death 25 years later. It is known as the Heiligenstadt Testament, and it is here that we learn the shocking truth. He had come perilously close to killing himself. What makes the revelation especially sad is that what held him back in the end was not his attachment to another human being, someone he loved too much to simply abandon him or her, but what he called his art, the art of music and composition, as if that were the only friend he had in the world. That early portrait was deceptive. He was in fact desperately lonely. Let's hear all this in his own words. Oh, you men, he writes, who think or say that I am malevolent, stubborn or misanthropic. How greatly do you wrong me? You do not know the secret cause which makes me seem that way to you. For six years now, I have suffered a hopeless affliction made worse by senseless physicians from year to year deceived with hopes of improvement finally compelled to face the prospect of a lasting melody whose cure will take years or perhaps be impossible. Though I was born with a fiery active temperament, even susceptible to the diversions of society, I was soon compelled to isolate myself, to live my life alone. If at times I try to forget all this, oh, how harshly was I flung back by the doubly sad experience of my bad hearing. 
Yet it was impossible for me to say to people, speak louder, shout, for I am deaf. For how could I possibly admit an infirmity in the one sense which ought to be more perfect in me than in others, a sense which I once possessed in the highest perfection, a perfection such as few in my profession enjoy or ever have enjoyed? I cannot do it. Therefore, please forgive me when you see me withdraw, when I would have gladly mingled with you. My misfortune is doubly painful to me because I am bound to be misunderstood. For me, there can be no relaxation with my fellow men, no refined conversation, no mutual exchange of ideas. I must live almost alone, like one who has been banished. I can mix with society only as much as true necessity demands. If I approach people, a hot terror seizes me, and I fear being exposed to the danger that my condition might be noticed. Thus it has been during the last six months which I have spent in the country. What a humiliation for me when someone standing next to me heard a flute in the distance and I heard nothing, or someone standing next to me heard a shepherd singing, and again I heard nothing. Such incidents drove me almost to despair. A little more of that, and I would have ended my life. It was only my art that held me back. For it seemed to me impossible to leave the world until I had brought forth all that I felt was within me. So I endured this wretched existence, truly wretched for so vulnerable a body, which can be thrown by a sudden change from the best condition to the very worst. It was partly a confession, but also literally a testament, written to his two brothers and directing them how to dispose of his effects. It is hard to know how long Beethoven expected to be alive or how he expected to pass from this world. Death was on his mind. But he lived and coped, at first with ear trumpets, small ones to begin with, but becoming ever larger, until finally no degree of amplification could make sounds audible to him anymore. Then with conversation booklets, they allowed his friends to communicate to him in writing. He would speak to them in response, except when he did not want to be overheard, then he would write too. The booklets have survived because Beethoven was incapable of throwing anything written away, as though he owed it to posterity to leave the fullest possible documentation of his life. But the booklets are not easy to interpret. It is like listening to someone having a conversation on the phone. You hear only one part of the conversation and not the part that interests you most. But as the deafness progressed and soon became impossible to hide, it complicated Beethoven's life in yet another way. In his thirties, he began to write music that was harder and harder for people to understand. Many of his works refused to be simply agreeable. Beethoven's compositional voice seemed like that of an intemperate man arguing loudly in polite society. Here is a different BBC documentary showing that kind of response. After a performance of his third symphony, one of the assembled aristocrats works, walks up to him and shares his opinion. Once upon a time, an aristocrat like him might have hired composers as his servants, and actually he still has difficulty accepting that the music might be better than he is able to understand. That wasn't bad. It's not a symphony, though. And you sit in judgment, do you? You decide what is art. Oh, steady on, steady on, young man. I didn't say it wasn't art. The symphony has a structure. This is a formless mass, a mere arrangement of noise, a great piling up of colossal ideas. It's very moving. In parts, it has elements of the sublime, but it is also full of discord, and it lacks rounding out. It is not what we call a symphony. I, 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 I don't think it's concluded yet, is it? My point entirely. It's lunchtime and we're only halfway through. I take it it does have four movements. Gerhard! Matthias. You must admit, dear friend, it is rather difficult. That Serene Highness is the most lavish praise that can be given to an artist. Really? How paradoxical. Why? 
Because difficult is good. Difficult is beautiful. Difficult is closer to the truth. People who felt this way about Beethoven's music, it was not hard to reach for a convenient explanation. Of course Beethoven composed badly, they reasoned, because he could not even hear what he was writing. His works were the futile efforts of a deaf man. But Beethoven, who had once decided against suicide for the sake of his art, was not going to compromise that same art for the sake of the world's approval. He had a higher calling. He had a keen sense of his artistic dignity and was not prepared to suffer demeaning professional conditions. The following clip from a BBC documentary is based on an actual event in his life. His outburst of anger in this situation would have been unthinkable even a few decades previously. There are, um... Ah, Ludwig! Come in! Oh, come and join us! I'd like you to meet my friends. We never stop moving. You never know the next time you'll feel clean sheets or a comfortable bed. And that is, until we stay here. Gentlemen, I propose a toast. To our host. To our host. Oh. Thank you. Well, I hope I can make your stay all the better by persuading our guest of honour, Herr Ludwig van Beethoven, to play for us. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm very tired. I better go to bed. It's early. I have a very busy day tomorrow. I have a lot to do. Herr Beethoven, please. You would honour us with your playing. Play! 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 I'm not a performing seal! He may not be a performing seal, but he's certainly a Rhineland pig. Perhaps we should arrest him, gentlemen. <laughs> I doubt if any of you swine would know what a piano keyboard looked like if it was blown to from the end of a cannon. I will not play for you! Nor will I play for your emperor. Napoleon. Can't your guest take a joke? Such is the nature of the artistic mind, gentlemen. If you'll excuse me. It may be pure coincidence, but the aggressive chanting of play, 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 with hammering on the table, recalls a scene from the Hollywood movie, Immortal Beloved. The makers of this movie were by and large successful in avoiding the inconvenience of historical truth, reasoning correctly that the truth rarely makes for gripping movies. But the following clip is as truthful as it gets. It illustrates the humiliating experience of performing before contemptuous and contemptible people, which Beethoven had as a, as a boy. And it reveals the painful association that the hammering on the table may have had for Beethoven. But I was pig-headed. I wouldn't play that tingly, pretty stuff that was in vogue then. But the keyboards of the day were not up to it. The first time I played at court, I broke four strings. Hey, Beethoven! The boy is hardly a Mozart, is he? I was twelve, but father told them I was nine.
This is the truth. He had regularly received beatings from his alcoholic father, and these left him with a residue of anger that could and would find unexpected targets throughout his life. The targets weren't always deserving. The concert which has featured the two the premieres of two of his symphonies, and by the way, also his fourth piano concerto, put the orchestra in an impossible situation, and it was made worse by Beethoven's explosions of rage during the rehearsals. Stop! Stop! What's wrong? What's, what's the matter? What markings have you got to? Why have you stopped? You're really sick for you, too. Come on. I know it's early. Again. Well, he didn't make it easier for himself or others. Beethoven's conducting style was so wild and hard to follow, and he was so demanding that eventually the orchestra refused to play if he was present. It was left to the unfortunate Rees to act as go-between. Sir, they say there is too much. There is so much new work, uh, and it is too difficult. Beethoven, you know we only have one rehearsal, and the orchestra are merely human. Just tell them to play it, exactly as I have written it. Yet Beethoven had the good fortune that times were changing in favor of composers and that the artistic independence of artistic geniuses was respected. Nobility became, came to regard it as their responsibility to support great composers unconditionally. To make Beethoven financially independent, several of his aristocrat friends in Vienna came together and awarded him an annual, annual pension for life. Beethoven graciously condescended to accept the gesture, which was no more than his birthright to receive. You must understand I need total artistic freedom. Yes, it's all fine, Ludwig. I need to travel whenever I want and have benefit concerts when I need them. It's all in the annuity contract. What we ask is that you agree to continue to live in Vienna.
Since this lecture is about both Beethoven and Mozart, it is helpful to compare this with Mozart's experience less than three decades previously. He too had his dignity as a musician, and the life of a servant was intolerable to him. He began his career as a musician in the service of the Archbishop of Salzburg, but after the umpteenth reprimand, he finally decided to submit his resignation. He was better off alone. Yet it did not end well. His letter of resignation was initially refused. But after a heated argument, he was thrown out of the Archbishop's palace with what he himself described as a kick in the butt. The remaining 10 years of his life were spent as an independent composer and would end in abject poverty. How Mozart and all of humanity would have profited if he had been awarded a pension as generous as that of Beethoven. Dois-je comprendre que votre grandeur n'est pas entièrement satisfaite de mes services Ses services Il ose parler de ses services. Jamais je n'étais si mal servi. Et jamais moi je n'ai eu tant de mal à servir. Qu'est-ce que vous avez dit Disparaissez, filez Je ne peux rien avoir à faire avec vous, ni moi non plus avec votre grandeur. Monseigneur, demain j'aurai l'honneur de vous envoyer ma démission. Monsieur, il tremble. Qu'est-ce qui vous arrive Je l'ai fait. Je l'ai fait. Monsieur, vous avez mal. Fait. Je l'ai fait. Je l'ai fait. Mais lâchez-moi, monsieur. Lâchez-moi. Si vous êtes malade, allez-vous coucher. Je l'ai fait. Monsieur l'organiste est concertement. Qu'est-ce qu'il vous prend Il me prend que j'ai envoyé une lettre de démission ici même. Il me prend que j'attends depuis huit jours la réponse. Pour une bonne raison, la lettre, je l'ai gardée pour moi. Mais de quel droit Du droit de l'amitié, Mozart. Vous faites une bêtise. Et un ami, c'est quelqu'un qui est là pour vous empêcher de faire des bêtises. Est-ce que vous vous, vous êtes tout ébloui par quelques compliments, par quelques femmes du monde, toujours prêtes à se pâmer Mais je... pour n'importe quoi Demain, elles se pâmeront pour un autre et elles vous auront parfaitement oublié. Croyez-moi, rien ne vaut un emploi stable, solide, même modeste, mais sûr. Vous ne croyez pas si bien dire. Notre père, en effet, m'a écrit. Il m'a supplié d'obtenir le pardon de sa grandeur. Qu'est-ce que vous dites oh. Vous vous êtes tous ligués contre moi, tous Vous Mon père, l'archevêque Vous vous êtes tous ligués contre moi, hein Arco, je vous regarde, je vous reconnais, vous êtes comme eux. Vous avez le même visage celui du pouvoir, celui de l'oppression, de la haine, de la liberté, et celui de la peur. Mozart, vous perdez la tête. Comment vous pouvez dire à mon père Bon, je... très bien, je l'enverrai votre lettre. Dès demain. Pourquoi demain Parce qu'aujourd'hui, vous êtes en plein délire. Je vous laisse encore 24 heures. Mais moi, je n'ai que faire de vos 24 heures. Mais enfin, Mozart, moi aussi, tout compte que je sois, j'encaisse des affronts, des avanies. Monsieur le comte, vous avez peut-être des raisons de vous laisser marcher dessus. Moi, non. Mozart All this may seem like a long detour in social history, but actually it's directly connected with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. This work had a difficult reception at first, 
but it soon prevailed even over the most hostile audiences. The reason essentially lies in the acceptance of a new idea, that before the genius of a truly great composer, it is not just the aristocracy that should know its place, but the audience at large as well. It behooves them to understand his work, at least if they want to make a claim to culture of any kind. And if they don't, then, well, they're deserving of the contempt of those who know better. The Fifth Symphony marks an important moment in this history. But before we turn to its broader historical significance, let's first look at it as another example of sonata form. In many ways, the first movement is exactly as you expect. It has a first theme and a second, and the second theme is in a new key. Between the two themes, Beethoven generates an incredible amount of musical energy, more than most audiences would have felt comfortable hearing, only to hold back at the last moment and make way for the second theme. That theme is once again gentle and initially for strings only. The first theme is, of course, the famous one. Three repeated notes, followed by a fourth that is usually different in pitch. We will get to the second theme in a moment. Now let's look at the broad canvas, sonata form. The Fifth Symphony closely resembles the trio of Don Giovanni. Not only is there a movement away from the home key and then back, but before returning, Beethoven moves even further away from the home key. There's another point I have to mention here. It's the fact that this symphony is in a minor key, C minor. So the home chord, or tonic, is a minor triad on C. The convention in minor keys is that you move not to the dominant, but to the nearest major key, which in this case is E flat. So bearing this in mind, we can now take a look at the beginning of the symphony. The home chord is C minor. The first theme is the four note motive. The second key is E flat major. And the second theme is a gentle one. In between, we have the transition from one to the other. This is the moment to generate speed, and Beethoven does a good job of it. He takes that first motive and weaves it into what is a rapid crescendo. You will now hear it on the piano. That's a percussive instrument, as I've mentioned before, involving hammers on strings. And the transition actually sounds pretty violent if you play it on the piano. Think of it as Beethoven giving his father a solid beating in return would have served him right. But contemporary audiences didn't know what hit them. There's another point that ties in with something I've pointed out before. Beethoven generates speed, but he makes sure to keep the harmonic rhythm low. If we listen just to the chords of the transition, here's what you get. And here is how all this sounds when played by the orchestra.
You will have noticed in this last slide that the movement is divided in three parts, and that these parts are given the labels exposition, development, and recapitulation. This has to do with a new definition of sonata form that becomes highly influential in Beethoven's lifetime. This definition is not in terms of keys, at least not in the first instance, but in terms of themes. It's as if sonata form now narrates a story of themes almost as if they were characters in an opera. The first section is called exposition because the themes are presented here in orderly fashion, a bit like the list of ingredients before you get to the cooking instructions. That would make the next section, the development, analogous to the cooked cooking instructions themselves. You chop up or grind the ingredients, mix them together, throw in some salt, and you're done. Please forgive the utter absurdity of this analogy. Then follows the recapitulation, which presents the themes once again in a formal restatement. There's not a textbook of music appreciation that won't explain sonata form in these terms. Just look at our own textbook. We have two orderly presentations of the themes, exposition and recapitulation. And there is a green development section in the middle. This diagram doesn't speak of first theme or second theme, but of principal subject and second subject. are simply unimaginative and can pass over it in silence. Here's another one, which at least throws in some color, but may not be the overwhelming favorite in a design contest. One of the problems with it is that we seem to be going back to the idea of building blocks. The origins of sonata form are in the theater. It was developed to convey dramatic action. That is the opposite of stacking blocks. In this diagram, on the other hand, the blocks are rounded and they are floating in space. I don't know if that is an improvement. This one has particularly massive blocks, but also a heartbeat, even with a stretch of arrhythmia in the middle. We find the exact same heartbeat in this diagram. Somebody must have felt that it was particularly effective as an explanation and decided to copy it in Photoshop. That would at any rate explain why somebody else dispensed with the blocks and showed only the heartbeat. But I don't really know what to make of this one. It reminds me somehow of an IQ test, which in this case would expose me as very dumb. On the other hand, I just love the board game idea. Now Sonata Form has a start and a finish, and you can actually win at it, a race. That's dramatic action for you. Finally, look at this. It's the work of a professor who has such a high opinion of himself that he presumes to have a laugh at the expense of other professors. And it's pathetic. Imagine taking a course with that guy. But by way of conclusion, there's one thing I want to emphasize. All these diagrams make the point that sonata form is something you can understand and perhaps must understand. I don't personally think so. And that's because I don't see sonata form as an artistic goal or purpose in its own right. It's a vehicle for something else, like it was in the Mozart opera. His trio is about three living, breathing human beings. And sonata form is a way of shaping the action that evolves between them. The point is the action, not the form that shapes it. Of course, Beethoven's symphony is not about particular human beings. But what you hear is dramatic action. That's the language he speaks, the language of the theater. To make that clear, all you would need to do is to create characters and make them act out what is already implicit in the music. There's no better way to show this than the following sketch, which was broadcast on live TV in the 1950s. It's called Argument to Beethoven's Fifth. You could almost imagine that this was a scene in an opera. We have to imagine a proceeding restative that moved from mounting irritation to open warfare. It doesn't really matter what the argument is about. That's the thing about drama. If people are arguing on the other side of the street, you're going to have to stop and watch and feel involved, even without knowing what it's about. It's amazing how little understanding is needed to get totally absorbed in dramatic action. 
This sketch will make you forget all about sonata form and focus on what is really important. Enjoy. <laughs> To be continued. 